Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. At this hour, the small cafe in the city center was quite crowded. Anna and Bessie struggled to find two vacant seats in a remote corner and ordered a set lunch. Bessie winked at her friend. You can start. No need to waste time. Tell me, what's the trouble with you? Anna looked cautiously at the man sitting next to her, enthusiastically slurping borscht with sour cream. Her glance was interpreted by him as a desire to chat, and he cheerfully remarked. My job is stressful, and after stress, I always have a beastly appetite, but the borscht here is excellent, neutralizes any stress. As if confirming his words, the man smacked his lips once again. Bessie's seatmate burst into laughter, she gave Anna a meaningful look, and sighed in the unique language they had used since school, signaling that the conversation would have to wait until the borscht enthusiast finished his meal. Meanwhile, the man quickly finished the first course and moved on to the cutlets. Anna was becoming increasingly bothered by his presence, and she hoped that eating cutlets with mashed potatoes wouldn't be accompanied by unpleasant sounds. But she realized her predictions were wrong when the neighbor pulled a plate of fresh cabbage salad toward him. Now, crunching sounds joined the smacking. The situation clearly amused Bessie, and Anna pleaded with her through her eyes, but Bessie shrugged, saying, Sorry, friend, no empty seats in this place. Indeed, all the tables were occupied, and as soon as a spot became available, someone else immediately occupied it. After a short pause, Bessie glanced at Anna again. Relax. Our order is on the way. The young waitress skillfully cleared the tray and wished them a pleasant appetite. The neighbor had finished his lunch and was sipping compote. Pushing the glass aside, he reluctantly stood up. Thanks for the pleasant company, but work awaits me. Bessie waved him off with a smile. Anna. It seems we're alone now. Seize the moment. Tell me, what emergency situation are you facing? But before Anna could open her mouth, another hungry visitor took the recently vacated seat next to her. An elderly man tactfully asked. Am I bothering you? The woman forced a smile. No, not at all. Enjoy your meal. The man cheerfully replied. And you too. They make an extraordinary borscht here. That's why I'm a longtime fan of this place. Anna thought with irritation. Another borscht enthusiast. Perhaps this cafe is a gathering place for fans of this dish? Bessie was barely holding back her laughter. She whispered to Anna. Anna. All is not lost. Eat calmly. We'll talk afterward. Anna had an urgent matter with her friend, a delicate request. When she asked Bessie to meet, she hadn't planned to spend money and time on lunch, but Bessie insisted. Anna, don't be mad, but my time is scheduled to the second. So I try to combine useful with pleasant whenever possible. Let's discuss your problem during lunch break. Let's meet at Parnas. As Anna played the role of a petitioner, she had to agree to her friend's conditions. She arrived early at the cafe, well reputed in the city's office environment, and waited for her friend. Bessie arrived in just a couple of minutes, but the place was already full. They had no choice but to accept the circumstances. When they left the cafe, Bessie looked at her watch. We still have about 10 minutes. Can you express your wishes in that time? Bessie looked at her a bit condescendingly, and her tone carried a hint of arrogance. Anna realized that a friendly conversation was unlikely. She was ready to abandon her intention to seek help from her friend, but Bessie knew her too well. She hugged Anna in a friendly manner. Don't be upset that everything turns out this way. But you understand, to stay afloat, you have to keep yourself in shape all the time. Believe it or not, due to the crazy workload, Willie and I can't exchange a word, let alone discuss more personal matters. It's a complete failure for us. Anna understood that Bessie would now start telling her about her own misfortunes, exhausting the time limit. She rudely interrupted her friend. Bessie, forgive me, but you yourself said you have very little time. I understand how difficult it is for you to cope with the absence of closeness with your husband, but I hope you will listen to me. 
Apparently, her friend did not expect such a sharp turn. The smile disappeared from her well-groomed face. Well, fine. I'm listening to you. Anna intuitively felt that she would now receive a refusal, but it was too late to back down. Bessie. You probably know that Barry is in the hospital. The woman's face instantly took on a pained expression. Yes, I know. My clients keep talking about it. After all, your husband is a well-known person in our city. He has educated so many young people. I sincerely sympathize with you and am ready to help in any way I can. Anna interrupted her. That's what I'm counting on. You see, all our money is tied up. Before his illness, Barry invested them in some promising project, and now a fairly large sum is urgently needed. For treatment? But as far as I know, the doctor's prognosis is bleak. Bessie hugged her friend again. Anna, I understand your desire to help your husband, but is it worth throwing money away on a hopeless cause? The heartless words of her friend caused Anna a momentary shock. She looked at Bessie with astonishment, unable to believe that she could equate the expenses for someone's treatment with unwarranted extravagance. Bessie, how can you say such things? What if, God forbid, something tragic happens to your Willie? Anna. Please, don't stress me out. A person can't predict how they will act in a particular situation. So it's better not to fill your head with negative thoughts. Feeling that Bessie would skillfully change the subject again, Anna asked. Don't evade the question, Bessie. Tell me straight. Will you give me the money? The owner of a small shop, which she had bought with their assistance, glared angrily. No, I won't. I don't allocate funds for a hopeless cause in advance. After all, there's no guarantee that Barry's treatment will help. I don't want scammers to use my money. Don't be offended, but I don't believe in unproven treatment methods, no matter how they are advertised on TV. Anna felt like her whole world was crumbling before her eyes. She muttered softly. Bessie, no need for explanations. I understand everything. Anna turned sharply and headed towards the bus stop. Bessie shouted after her. Anna. Why are you running away from me so quickly? Come on, let's think together about what can be done. Anna turned around. You'll be late for work. Ten minutes have already passed. Bessie spitefully retorted. Need money? Then sell your car or apartment, it's that simple. Or are you too attached to your belongings? Tears streamed down Anna's cheeks, and bitter resentment filled her heart. Anna never expected her best friend, with whom she had been through thick and thin, to refuse her. She thought in despair. How quickly you forgot all the good we, Barry and I, did for you. You were nobody, and now you're acting like a countess. Ungrateful pig. Anna expressed all this in her thoughts, hoping for temporary relief, but it only made her feel worse, and she cried again. To whom else can I turn? She began mentally going through friends and acquaintances, but after the first failure, her determination faded. She tried to calm herself. I need to cool down and think everything through. If Bessie categorically refused, others might do the same. Inside, something pricked her painfully, and resentment towards her friend clouded her vision. Never thought I'd get a blow from my best friend. A passing man looked at her with surprise, and Anna realized that she had voiced her thoughts about her friend out loud. To calm herself, she closed her eyes and took a few deep breaths. This technique was taught to her by her daughter Darby, who was interested in theatrical arts in childhood and later joined the University of Culture. She claimed that breathing exercises helped calm the nerves. Darby's method helped Anna calm down a bit. She got on the bus headed to the state hospital where her husband was currently undergoing treatment. Despite Anna's attempts to tune into a positive wave, the unpleasant conversation with Bessie lingered in her mind. As long as Anna could remember, Bessie had always been there. Their mothers worked together for many years at a confectionery factory producing various sweets. The women were close friends and often took their daughters to the same daycare. Bessie immediately assumed the role of a leader, much to the delight of her mother. That's right, daughter. Let everyone know who they're dealing with. 
Sometimes it's useful to use audacity if it helps the cause. Anna's mother disagreed with her friend. Someday, your Bessie's commander-like antics will lead to trouble. Children don't like such show-offs and may retaliate. But Bessie appealed to Anna's mother with her daughter's enthusiasm, and she even encouraged her daughter's desire to elbow her way through, considering audacity one of the best qualities. You won't get anywhere today without audacity. If you're too soft, you won't achieve anything in life. But Anna's mother saw through Bessie. Her prediction came true when the girls were in fifth grade. They noticed that Bessie Price was constantly running to the teachers, and they decided to teach her a lesson for being a snitch. Only Anna dared to stand up for her friend. In return, she received a barrage of blows from her classmates. After this disciplinary action, Bessie toned down her zeal a bit, but soon everything returned to its usual course. True, classmates no longer engaged in physical bullying, but instead, they completely ignored Bessie. Anna, too, ended up under the weight of general contempt. This continued until the end of high school, and then the paths of the two friends diverged. Anna enrolled in university, while Bessie, with her diploma, had to enroll in college. The revival of their friendship began after Anna's wedding, or rather during the preparations for the event. Not long before the celebration, Bessie unexpectedly called. Can I congratulate you? I heard you're getting married. Anna didn't expect this call, so she responded hesitantly due to confusion. Yes, I'm getting married soon, no free time at all. I see. Do you have a moment for a friend? The tone made Anna feel embarrassed for some reason. She tried to justify herself. Bessie, I lost track of you. You stopped calling me. You could have checked with my mom. Sorry, it didn't occur to me. Bessie laughed in her unique manner. I'll forgive you only if I get to be the bridesmaid at your wedding. Although Anna had already chosen her classmate as a witness, she gave in to Bessie. However, she never regretted it, as her friend handled the duties perfectly. During the festivities, Bessie, seemingly casually, hinted that she was having trouble finding employment. Winking slyly with her bold eyes, she said. If you find me a job, we'll call it even. Consider it payment for my services. Barry didn't like Bessie's audacity back then. Yeah, your friend is not exactly modest. Honestly, I didn't expect her to lay down such conditions just for attending our wedding. Anna felt embarrassed for her friend, and she didn't want to refuse her. She pleaded with her husband. Barry, not everyone meets your standards, but Bessie and I have been friends for so many years. You don't need to continue. I'll try to do everything in my power for your wayward friend. Anna doesn't know what measures Barry took at that time, but soon Bessie announced that her former suitor had backed off. Anna, you won't believe it. He even gave me some extra money. Said he miscalculated the interest. The amount is small, but enough to invest in a profitable venture. Anna asked. Bessie, maybe you shouldn't step on the same rake again? In her characteristic manner, her friend replied. Fear the wolves not to go into the woods. This time, I'll be more cautious. Bessie rented a small space and turned it into a tailoring studio for minor clothing repairs. Surprisingly, this venture turned out to be profitable, providing a modest but steady income. Two years later, Bessie decided to buy a small shop, but once again, she lacked the funds. The Harris couple unconditionally gave her the necessary amount, and Barry Harris, in particular, displayed the generosity of his noble soul. Repay the money when you can. No need to rush. And Bessie didn't rush. For almost 10 years, she repaid the debt bit by bit, expressing regret every time during the money transfer procedure. It's so easy to borrow, and so hard to repay. Too bad you can't cancel a debt due to its age, like in criminal practice. Such statements always made Anna uneasy, but she tactfully remained silent. Only now did she realize from personal experience that not even close friends always reciprocate for kindness. Anna had heard the common expression many times that trouble comes when you least expect it. For a long time, this phrase was just a set of words for her. Its meaning became clear to her for the first time when her father had a stroke. That Sunday changed her entire future. 
summer was counting its last days, and the whole family went to the dacha to harvest and prepare for the construction of a new house. The plot, allocated to her father for his merits, was cherished by her parents as if their lives depended on that small piece of land. Starting from spring, they spent all their free time at their dacha, finishing the work in deep autumn. Although the wooden structure, barely meeting the criteria for a, a summer cottage, was only 10 square meters in size, Anna's parents were very proud of this piece of real estate, while Anna constantly laughed at their attachment to it. Your dacha looks more like Uncle Tom's cabin or Mr. Pumpkin's house. A strong wind might blow it away. Mr. Gray had a healthy sense of humor and didn't take offense at his daughter's criticism. There's nothing wrong with our dacha being small. Once I retire, I'll build a two-story house. Anna's mother also dreamed of turning the shed into something decent so that they wouldn't be ashamed in front of the neighbors. However, she didn't want to wait until her husband retired. So, during the peak of the farming season, she kept saying. Look at how beautifully people transform their plots, and here we have not a house but a dog house. It's good enough for the summer season. You're not planning to move here. Anything is possible. If we bring water here, install heating, we can even live here in winter. Maybe Anna will get married and settle in the dacha. For a long time, the man resisted his wife's attacks, but one day he couldn't take it anymore. What's with you women and nagging? Do you know how much money we'll spend on improving this house? Mrs. Allen replied with a smile. Dear, don't play the poor man. We're not starving. I'm not asking you to start construction right away. We can gradually move towards the goal. First, buy the materials, then bring in water. Mr. Gray reluctantly agreed to his wife's plan, and Mrs. Allen couldn't wait to start construction. On that Sunday, they were supposed to receive construction blocks. So, the mother hurried her daughter and husband. Hurry up, or people will arrive, and the owners won't be around. This is the schedule. Your father and I will carry the construction blocks, and you, dear daughter, will take care of the garden beds. Since childhood, Anna had no interest in farming, and she received her mother's plea without optimism. Mom, let's switch places. You go to the garden beds, and I'll help dad. Everyone agreed to this distribution of duties. When they arrived at the location, Anna went to the neighbors and asked them for a cart. Things got moving quickly. Anna loaded the vehicle, and her father transported the blocks to the shed. The work was almost done when Mr. Gray suddenly fell next to the fully loaded cart. At first, Anna thought he had just stumbled and ran towards him. Dad, why are you so clumsy? But her father didn't respond. He lay motionless with wide open eyes. Only his lips moved, but the words were impossible to make out. All that could be heard clearly was daughter. Call mom. The ambulance reached the village only 40 minutes later. By that time, Mr. Gray had already lost consciousness. As it later turned out, the man's condition worsened because the women tried to move him into the house. The paramedic was very blunt about it. Why did you touch him? Don't you know that in such situations, you shouldn't move the person? Mrs. Allen was still in a state of shock and responded haphazardly. How would mom know? We're not doctors. He fell, and that's it. We couldn't just leave him lying on the cold ground. The mother cried bitterly, and Anna, with bitterness, told the medic. You could have arrived earlier. They wanted to get into the car to accompany the father to the hospital, but apparently, the paramedic was offended and slammed the ambulance door in front of them. We're not a taxi to shuttle everyone around. Only late in the evening did the mother and daughter reach the city by hitchhiking and immediately went to the hospital. There they learned that the father was in critical condition. The doctor sadly said. If you had brought the patient to the hospital right away, the prognosis would have been more favorable. Now we can only hope for a miracle. Mrs. Allen was still in a state of shock and responded randomly. How was mom supposed to know? We're not doctors. He fell, that's it. Could we leave him lying on the cold ground? The mother cried bitterly, and Anna, with bitterness, said to the paramedic. You could have come earlier. 
They wanted to get into the car to accompany their father to the hospital, but apparently, the paramedic took offense and slammed the ambulance door in front of them. We're not a taxi to shuttle everyone around. Only late in the evening did the mother and daughter reach the city by hitchhiking and immediately went to the hospital. There they learned that the father was in critical condition. The doctor sadly said. If you had brought the patient to the hospital right away, the prognosis would have been more favorable, and now all that's left is to hope for a miracle. Of course, the miracle did not happen. But that time, the doctors still managed to pull Mr. Gray out of the clutches of death. However, after the stroke, he became a disabled person, unable to take care of himself. Mrs. Allen no longer had time for the garden and the cottage. She put in a lot of effort to make her husband's life easier. At that time, Anna was already studying at the institute, but she always came home for the weekends. Mr. Gray only began to slowly recover after six months. His speech returned, and he gradually started moving on his own, even making jokes. Mrs. Allen rejoiced at his successes. Anna, it seems like trouble passed us by. Your father is already helping me around the house with a cane. God willing, he'll be running around soon. But heaven did not hear the woman's prayers, who couldn't imagine life without her beloved husband. Two years later, a second stroke occurred, from which Mr. Gray did not recover. After her husband's death, Mrs. Allen became withdrawn. She didn't leave the apartment for weeks and lost all interest in the dacha plot. Anna tried various ways to pull her mother out of this state, but all her attempts failed. Not even the grandchildren could bring the woman back to life. Mrs. Allen could sit for hours without moving, staring at a photograph of her husband. Anna watched her mother and thought. May God spare me from experiencing such grief. But the young woman did not know what a heavy trial fate had prepared for her. Mrs. Allen outlived her husband by eight years. She passed away peacefully in her sleep. In the conclusion, the doctors diagnosed heart failure. This surprised Anna because her mother had never complained about her heart. They didn't even have Validol in their home medicine cabinet. It was the second blow from which Anna could not recover for several years. Crystal Morgan stared in disbelief. No, it can't be. I'm an optimist in life, and only positive thoughts come to my mind. You should see a psychologist, get some advice. Maybe you have issues due to work or family responsibilities, any troubles? No, Crystal. Everything is good and calm in my family, but it's precisely this calmness that worries me. Her friend thought for a moment and then said firmly. Push away those negative thoughts, try to focus on something else. I have a friend who is a psychologist, by the way. I could arrange for her to see you. She advised me that in such moments, when everything seems bleak, you should switch to something positive. For example, go shopping and buy yourself a bunch of unnecessary stuff. Anna smiled. I'm not used to spending money in vain. Then take a vacation, change the environment. Anna liked the second option more, and she wanted to discuss it with her husband, but she didn't get a chance. Barry Harris returned from work that evening exhausted and went straight to bed. Anna paid no attention to it and continued bustling around the kitchen. She prepared dinner, set the table, and only then decided to check on her husband. Barry was asleep, and she tried to wake him. Don't sleep at this time. What will you do at night? The man opened his eyes with difficulty. Anna, something doesn't feel right. My whole body aches, and breathing is difficult. I'll just lie down for a bit. She exclaimed. What about dinner? I tried, I cooked. Barry Harris didn't want to upset his wife and, overcoming his weakness, got out of bed. He chewed the goulash without appetite, and Anna could see that the process was painful for him. Barry, don't force yourself to eat. Have some tea and go rest. She felt sorry for her husband, and in a burst of genuine feelings, she kissed him on the forehead and immediately recoiled. Barry. Yes, you're burning up. You need to measure your temperature. The man forced a smile. Nothing serious. Probably caught a draft. With such a caring wife like you, I'll recover quickly. 
In the morning, Anna took leave from work and called a doctor to come to their home. The elderly doctor listened to Barry's lungs for a long time but didn't find anything suspicious. Nothing serious. Just a common cold, but you should still observe bed rest for three days. The local doctor made an accurate diagnosis. On the third day, the man began to feel better and returned to work. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief, but two weeks later, the situation repeated itself. This time, in addition to weakness and a fever, shortness of breath appeared. Anna called the doctor again, who expressed his dissatisfaction. Ah, why are you surprised, woman? Your husband should have strictly followed my recommendations. Anna said uncertainly. He did everything the doctor told him. The local doctor looked at the woman first with disbelief, then gave the patient a disapproving look. If he had followed everything as I instructed, there wouldn't have been a recurrence. The woman asked hesitantly. Doctor. I think there's something else wrong with my husband. It's not just a cold. Maybe he needs some tests, or a scan. She would have been better off not saying that. The doctor got angry in the literal sense of the word, his carefully shaved face turned red, and a vein popped on his forehead. If you know everything, then why did you call the doctor? Do you think I have nothing better to do than run around empty apartments? The woman was stunned by the unexpected outburst, and the patient tried to defend his wife. Doctor, why are you shouting at my wife? She suggested a perfectly rational solution, and I don't mind getting a scan. Another smart guy. Everything in your lungs is fine. So, there's no need. The doctor switched to a normal tone, but his hands were still shaking when he wrote a prescription. Here, take these capsules twice a day, and before you leave, have a complete blood test done. The doctor went to the hallway, showing with his whole appearance that he was offended by the patient and his wife. Before leaving, he lingered at the door. I have 35 years of experience behind me. If you don't trust me, consult another specialist. On the day of discharge, Barry Harris did not meet that doctor at the clinic and went to see another doctor. The new doctor didn't even examine him and closed the sick leave. The man asked uncertainly. Your colleague said I need to take a blood test. In response, he heard the familiar answer. What knowledgeable patients we have nowadays. Everything in your vital signs is normal. You could go to space tomorrow. The doctor clearly mocked him, making Barry Harris feel extremely uncomfortable. He hurried to leave the office, thinking to himself. Why did I come here? At home, he briefly told his wife about his visit to the clinic and repeated out loud. Anna, you can't imagine how embarrassed I was. I've never run around clinics before, and I won't do it again. Anna Harris didn't try to dissuade her husband, considering the danger had passed. When, after a month, Barry had another relapse, he didn't allow her to call a doctor. Anna, I don't want to go there again. I still have some medicine from last time, and maybe it'll get better if I take it? On the third night, the husband's condition suddenly worsened. He began to suffocate, and his face turned into a blue swollen mask. Panic seized the woman, and she began to run around the apartment. Luckily, her son was at home. Mom, running around the apartment won't help. We need to call an ambulance. Arriving paramedics immediately took the patient to the hospital. Until morning, Anna Harris and her son sat outside the doors of the intensive care unit. In those hours, she reconsidered everything. It was fortunate that Mark was there. Although he was deeply concerned about his father, he tried to support his mother. Mom, everything will be okay. Dad is strong, he has been involved in sports all his life, he will definitely pull through. But the doctor who came out to them in the morning did not share the optimism. A very rare and very complex case, the first time I've encountered such in my practice. Your husband has an advanced inflammatory process. The outer lining of the heart is affected. Complicating the situation is that vital areas are involved in the inflammation. Tissues, to put it bluntly, have melted. Therefore, the heart is struggling to function. I won't sugarcoat it, this is a very severe case. She wanted to cry, but tears wouldn't come. 
She wanted to scream, but only a stifled wheeze escaped her throat. Mark tried to comfort his mother, but she sat there, almost paralyzed, unresponsive to his questions. The young man had to seek help from the medics. The sharp smell of ammonia brought the woman back to reality, and she whispered softly. Why didn't I take action right away? I felt it. My intuition warned me that tragedy was imminent. Tears broke through the dam of patience, and the woman burst into tears on her son's shoulder. It seemed like time stood still. Every day was a repetition of the previous. Since relatives were not allowed into the intensive care unit, they had to wait in the cramped vestibule outside the department. Anna Harris spent almost four days in this stuffy space, but heard nothing comforting from the doctors. On the fifth day, the attending physician invited her to the doctor's office, his face was inscrutable, but his voice carried reassuring notes. Anna Harris, we need to talk to you. The woman didn't ask the doctor unnecessary questions and followed him to the adjacent room. There was no one in the doctor's office, and Mr. Adams, with satisfaction, noted. My colleagues are currently examining their patients. So, we can talk calmly. The doctor adjusted his expensive glasses and looked at the woman, who was trembling with excitement. Anna Harris, you need to calm down. Anxiety and panic are unacceptable in such situations because they hinder the common cause. We have a challenging task ahead of us. The woman was surprised. A task for us? The doctor smiled. Ah, uh. why does that surprise you? You've probably heard before that without the help of relatives, a doctor finds it difficult to cope alone? So, we have to create a kind of alliance to act correctly and cohesively. Are you ready for this? The glimmer of hope that shone in the woman's soul at the doctor's first words gained strength. Of course, Mr. Adams. I'll do anything as long as my husband recovers. The doctor smiled again. I didn't expect any other answer from you, and your husband said that you are like a resilient tin soldier. That can be considered a compliment. Although, for most women, it's more common to hear different comparisons. Anna decisively interrupted the doctor. Are you saying that Barry said that? Does that mean he's getting better? Mr. Adams raised his eyebrows at the bridge of his nose, and his face instantly became stern and even severe. Yes, your husband's condition has improved thanks to comprehensive therapy, but the danger has not passed because the main problem has not been eliminated. I won't go into details not to scare you with unfamiliar terms and will try to describe the situation in simple words. Due to the advanced inflammatory process, if I may express it that way, a crucial part of the heart is out of order. The tissues are so damaged that they cannot perform their functions. While in the hospital, we can support the organ's work, but, as you understand, this cannot last indefinitely. Anna said quietly. I understand. What should we do? The only thing that can save your husband is surgery. Our doctors have developed a unique method for replacing heart valves, but, of course, it will require money, and a significant amount at that. Anna Harris physically felt how the glimmer of hope flared up in full force. She began nodding intensively. Mr. Adams, I will definitely find the necessary amount. Just tell me when the operation will be? The doctor spread his hands. I can't specify a date yet. Although Barry Harris's condition has noticeably improved, he is still very weak. Another reason is that the method I told you about has certain technological features, which also require a certain amount of time. If there are no complications, the operation can be performed in two to three weeks. And if we don't do the operation, what will happen to my husband? Mr. Adams looked away. Unfortunately, in this case, a tragic outcome is inevitable. Without life support, he won't be able to live at all. Therefore, surgery is the only salvation. The doctor saw the impression his words made on the distressed woman. But Mr. Adams couldn't act differently. He knew it was criminally wrong to give false hope, both to the patients and their relatives. He sincerely felt sorry for this woman, who wholeheartedly cared about her husband's life, but he couldn't deceive her. Seeing the spark in Anna's eyes extinguish, Mr. Adams dropped his professional tone. Don't despair, Anna Harris. 
In cases like yours, you have to seize even the slightest chance. I will keep you informed, and as soon as your husband's condition allows us to discuss the operation, I will inform you immediately. Anna Harris left her phone number and exited the doctor's office. She didn't yet know where to get the necessary sum to save her husband, but she was confident that she would find the money. Exactly a week passed since the conversation with the attending physician, but there was almost no progress in the financial matter. A significant hole now gaped in the family budget because even before his illness, Barry Harris invested all their savings in a project he had worked on for many years. Together with his colleague, he decided to establish a voluntary-based intellectual center for youth. According to the plan, this multifunctional center was supposed to be a place where young people could explore various interesting fields. The initiative of the educators was actively supported by the city administration, but they mentioned that there was no money for its implementation. Barry Harris came home after the meeting in a disappointed state, he was very upset by the response from the authorities, which he confessed to his wife. I'm not a dreamer detached from real life, but I still hoped that, apart from empty words, the administration would allocate some amount of money. After all, it's a worthwhile cause for everyone. A real opportunity for teenagers to engage in something useful instead of aimlessly wandering the city. And then we all wonder why juvenile crime isn't decreasing? Anna Harris, being involved in her husband's plan as she worked in the Department of Education, had warned Barry Harris earlier that they wouldn't get funding from the municipal budget, but he didn't believe her. Now, when he saw the truth of her words, he wanted to reassure him. Barry. You knew exactly this would happen. You should have thought of alternative funding methods in advance. The man exclaimed. Anna. What are you talking about? If you mean fundraising or sponsor injections, I won't go around the city with my hand out. I'd rather invest my own money than beg. Anna Harris guessed that her husband intended to use the money they had saved for many years to start a family business. This idea was suggested to them by Darby. The daughter even promised to develop a business plan but quickly lost interest. However, the head of the Harris family seized on this idea and infected his son with it. Although the men hadn't come to a unanimous decision on the choice of the business direction yet, Mark wanted to deal with computer equipment repairs, while the elder of the Harris family was more interested in cars. When Barry Harris's life's work was threatened with complete failure, he decisively stated. Since such a turn has occurred, I will invest my money. I think Nick will support me. Anna Harris was bewildered. Barry, what about our family business, and what will you say to Mark? After all, the guy lived for this project. The man smiled. Anna. Nothing fundamentally changes because there is an opportunity to combine these two projects. Besides, some of the center's services can be offered on a paid basis. The woman objected. And do you think people will flock to you in droves? If the price is reasonable, it's quite possible. The main thing is to present our dish correctly. I hope Darby will help us with that. Wasn't it worth her studying at the university for five years? But thinking of something and implementing plans are entirely different. Nick Butler didn't immediately agree to give away his hard-earned money. So, Barry Harris had to use his eloquence. He vividly described the future prospects to his friend, and he gave in. The partners divided the responsibilities and began implementing the project. Serious health problems with Barry Harris had already emerged at that time. Therefore, he was in a hurry to complete the work he had started. It was as if he felt that the disease would strike him. Mr. Harris handed over the money to his partner shortly before being admitted to the hospital. Therefore, Anna Harris turned first to Nick Butler, hoping that their family capital had not yet been spent. She called her husband's colleague. Nick Butler, I apologize for bothering you, but we are in an extremely difficult situation. Nick Butler impatiently interrupted the woman. Yes, Anna Harris, I know. I visited the hospital the day before yesterday, but they didn't let me see Barry. He's in intensive care, and his condition is very serious. Hold on, Anna. God willing, everything will work out. The doctor said that only surgery can help Barry recover. The interlocutor impatiently cut off the woman again. 
Anna, trust our doctors, they are real wizards in white coats. A year ago, my wife's relative almost gave up the ghost. Blind rage overwhelmed the woman, and she cut off Nick in mid-sentence. I've also heard about the feats of our doctors, but right now, I'm not in the mood for stories about the miraculous recovery of strangers. At the moment, what concerns me most is my husband's life, and only urgent surgery can save him. That's why I need money. Nick Butler asked with amusement. I don't understand, Anna Harris, what does this have to do with me? I want to take back our money. Nick Butler chuckled. What money? The ones Barry gave you for the center's creation. The man froze for a few seconds, then spoke harshly. I sympathize with you, Anna Harris, but to my great regret, I can't help with anything. All the money has already been invested in our project, and it's impossible to retrieve them. In business, such games are unacceptable. Today you give, tomorrow you take back. The center's premises are already rented, specialists are hired. Anna screamed into the phone. What am I supposed to do? My husband is dying, and you're making jokes. Silence lingered for almost half a minute, then Nick Butler hesitantly said. Don't get so nervous, Anna Harris. I would like to help you, but I have very little left myself. I'll try asking my colleagues. Maybe the team will raise money for our comrade. Though I'm not sure we can gather the required amount, but Anna, keep me posted. She didn't have time to reply because Nick Butler ended the call. Bitter resentment and pain for her beloved overwhelmed the woman's heart. She was sure this approach would work. It hadn't even been a month since Barry recklessly handled their family capital. Anna Harris took out her list of friends whom she thought could help. The second name on the list was her childhood friend, but Bessie categorically refused as well. The meeting with her left an unpleasant feeling in Anna's soul, and she hesitated to call other acquaintances from the list. On the bus, Anna reached the final stop and slowly walked towards the state hospital. One thought pierced her mind. Where can I get the money for the operation? The most fantastic ways of obtaining the required amount came to her mind. However, her contemplation was interrupted by a call on her mobile phone. It was so unexpected that she startled. She calmed down upon hearing her daughter's voice. Mom, I've arrived. Where are you? Darby, I can't talk for long right now because I'm going to see your dad in the hospital. Her daughter's response left her puzzled. You're taking too long, Mom. Mr. Adams and I are tired of waiting for you. Hurry up, there's good news. Anna quickened her pace. Darby's lively voice and her words made her aching heart tremble. She reached the third floor, where her daughter was already waiting by the elevator. Anna took her daughter's arm, and they started talking without giving her a chance to collect herself. Let's see your dad first. They moved him from the intensive care unit to the intensive care ward. Surprised, Anna asked, then why did you rush me? You said Mr. Adams was waiting for me. The head doctor called him, but he'll be back soon. I'll tell you a secret, some fancy specialist from the Capitol examined dad today. I didn't see him because I came later, but Mr. Adams said that the question of the operation will be decided today or tomorrow. Probably, that's why the head doctor called him. I hope you found the money. Suddenly, Anna Harris's legs weakened. She swayed, and Darby asked anxiously, Mom, what's wrong? You almost fell. She hurriedly reassured her daughter, I'm fine. It's just that emotions are overwhelming today, all because of the money for the operation. Daughter, I don't know what to do, whom else to turn to? Darby, with irritation, remarked, Well, a few days ago, you claimed there would be no problems. Did I think that people I believed in would refuse me? Anna Harris handed her daughter the list. Of course, I haven't called everyone yet, but now I'm not sure if it's worth doing. Even my best friend, for whom Barry and I have done so much, flatly refused. Mom, you should cut off such friends. They say true friends are revealed in difficult times. And you're Bessie Price, if that's who you meant, she's a total leech. I realized that back in third grade when you kept feeding her all the time. Is this the gratitude you get now? 
Anna Harris was offended. Darby, you shouldn't speak about people like that. How could you come up with such an insulting nickname as a leech? Aunt Bessie and Dad's friend have their problems, and here I unexpectedly came with my request. Mom, you surprise me. You were blatantly deceived, and you still defend those deceitful friends from your list. The girl made a disgusted face. I can't stand such slippery characters. Anyway, let it be on their conscience. Let's go, visit Dad in the ward, but don't say anything to him. We'll discuss where else we can get money later, I have a couple of options. What options? Well, for example, we can take a loan from the bank. It won't work. The amount is too large. Then we can sell something. Darby, if you're hinting at the dacha, no one will give a cent for it. And if we sell the apartment, we'll have nowhere to live. I can ask Larry. And who's that? Well, kind of my boyfriend. We've been dating for a long time. True, he hasn't proposed yet, but Larry's dad has a lot of money. He's an expert. Evaluates paintings and all sorts of antiques. I don't think we should ask your cavalier's dad for money. Why not? Again, your conditions? Daughter, there are certain boundaries of decency that should not be crossed. Fine. We're here arguing and attracting unnecessary attention. A nurse came out of the room with a tray in her hands. She looked at the mother and daughter suspiciously. You can go in, but not more than five minutes. Barry Harris is still very weak. So, try not to upset him. Darby hurried to reassure the girl. Don't worry. We won't discuss serious matters. As soon as they crossed the threshold of the room, Anna Harris almost fainted again. She looked in horror at her husband, who was entangled in wires from all sides, with a tube coming out of his mouth. The woman rushed to her husband's bedside. Barry, my dear, how are you? Darby couldn't stop her mother in time, so she reached her at the bedside of her sick father. She whispered. Mom. Tone down the emotions, or they'll kick us out of here. Meanwhile, the man managed to open his eyes with difficulty. He couldn't speak as he was connected to a machine, but his gaze expressed joy. To prevent her mother from ruining everything, Darby pushed her aside and said. Dad, you're amazing and look not bad at all. You resemble a diver a bit. Soon you'll fully recover, and we'll all go on vacation together. If, of course, I don't get married by then. Barry Harris's face slightly reddened, and a playful sparkle danced in his eyes. He raised a thumbs up, indicating the highest approval. Anna Harris calmed down a bit and also wanted to cheer up her husband, but at that moment, a nurse entered the room and sternly announced. Mr. Adams is waiting for you. The women left the room, but Darby stopped at the threshold. Dad, hang in there. Everything will be fine. The man closed his eyes, signaling his agreement. Mr. Adams, with a thoughtful look, sat behind his desk in the office, flipping through someone's medical history. When the women entered the room, he waved his hand towards a row of chairs by the wall. Take a seat. Unfortunately, I'm short on time, so I'll be brief. Today, a highly competent specialist examined your father and husband. He's a renowned cardiothoracic surgeon. We used to work together. In short, there is an opportunity to perform the operation in the coming days. Darby even jumped in her chair with excitement. Excuse me, Mr. Adams. You can't imagine what you've done for us. Thank you so much. The doctor briefly glanced at the girl. Saving lives is my job, and there's no need to thank me yet. I just tried to expedite the process because even one missed day works against your father. Darby nodded. Yes, of course. We understand everything. Tell me, will you be the one operating on dad? No, not me. I have a different specialization. But don't worry, my colleague who examined him today works at the cardiology center, where the specialists are of the highest qualification. Of course, no one can guarantee a successful outcome of the surgery, but let's hope for the best. Anna Harris, stumbling over her words, said. Thank you, doctor. 
but I didn't expect everything to happen so quickly. The thing is, I haven't collected the required amount yet. Mr. Adams nervously twirled a pencil in his hand but misjudged his strength and broke the writing tool. Anna Harris, what do you suggest I do now? I went to great lengths to convince the best specialist to examine your husband, he found a way to operate on him out of turn. And what do I tell him tomorrow? Do you understand the position you've put me in? Darby sensed that a scandal was brewing and quickly reassured him. Mr. Adams, everything is fine. We'll handle this. Transfer dad to that center. Let them perform the surgery. We'll cover all the expenses. We can even write a promissory note. The doctor looked at the girl with skepticism. All services are covered by a special contract, and payment is made based on it. Are you sure there won't be any problems with payment? Darby confidently replied. Do I look like a swindler? When they left the office, Anna Harris pounced on her daughter. Darby, what are you thinking? Can you imagine what will happen if your adventure fails? The girl was slightly embarrassed. Of course, I can. But mom, you're not much better. You promised the doctor a lot of things. You know it. If you're not sure, don't make promises. It's not sandbox games. It's too early for you to teach your mother. Better tell me what you've planned. Darby sighed. I'll proceed to plan B, shake up Larry. Your scheme is doomed to fail. Your expert won't give us money. I'll try. I won't waste time. Larry is probably already waiting for me. And you, mom, stay in touch. Darby jumped into the elevator, which happened to stop on the third floor, leaving her mother bewildered. Anna Harris initially wanted to follow her daughter's example but changed her mind. Darby didn't let me talk to Barry. I'll go spend some time with him. She headed towards her husband's ward. Suddenly, the door opened right in front of her, and an unfamiliar woman dressed in all black walked out. Anna recoiled, thinking. Oh, dear. This person is missing a scythe in her hands. The woman didn't even look at her and majestically walked past. Only when she disappeared into the elevator did Anna Harris come to her senses. Who is this lady, and what was she doing in the ward? To get answers to these questions, Anna Harris rushed after her, but the elevator seemed to be stuck between floors. So, she ran to the emergency exit and descended to the first floor in less than a minute. However, the stranger in black was no longer there, and the woman on duty at the elevator asked in surprise. Did you lose someone? Anna, panting after the rapid descent, struggled to say. Yes. There was just an elderly woman here. Tell me, where did she go? The elevator operator waved her hand vaguely. That way. Is she your relative? If you hurry, you'll catch up with her. Despite regular workouts, even a moderate jog was challenging for her. Therefore, feeling depleted of energy and noticing a familiar figure at the bus stop, Anna Harris slowed down as there was no sign of public transport approaching soon. She needed to catch her breath. She was almost at her destination when a car swiftly pulled up to the stop, and the driver, whose face she couldn't make out, loudly said. Vera, hop in the back seat. The woman in black briskly ran towards the car, thanking the guy on the go. Oh, Christopher. So glad you noticed me. She energetically sat in the back seat. Anna ran to the car. Wait, please, ma'am. The stranger looked at her in surprise from the window of the now-moving car. Anna was on the verge of tears. She desperately wanted to know what this woman, whom she had never seen before in her life, was doing in the room of her dying husband. Various thoughts swirled in her head, adding to her confusion. Suddenly, it struck her. I need to go back to the hospital and find out everything from the nurse. After the unplanned run, her back and legs ached, so she had to cover the return journey at a normal pace. The duty nurse was sitting at her station, diligently making notes in the patient's medical histories. When Anna Harris asked her, she replied without hesitation. She's your husband's relative. That's why I let her in. She even showed me her passport. Her last name is Harris. 
Of course, I didn't remember her first name, but the surname confirms the family connection. So, everything is legal, and you have no claims against me. This information left the woman standing in place. The nurse looked at her with disapproval. In all my years working here, I never cease to be amazed by the peculiarities that happen to people. First, they quarrel, sever family ties, and then they look for someone to be close to. Can't you recognize your relative? Anna Harris didn't say anything. She was tired of the shocks of this day, and she desperately wanted to get home as soon as possible. Thoughts again swirled restlessly in her mind, but she was no longer able to regulate their flow. Only in the evening did she regain the ability to assess the situation sensibly. The most troubling was this unfamiliar woman, seemingly entering her life out of nowhere. Anna realized that this person was not suitable for the role of a lover due to her respectable age. So, who was this stranger? Larry didn't hear the door of her small workshop open. Inspiration accompanied her from early morning, and she decided to use it to the fullest. In such moments, the nerves of the young woman were like a taut string. Therefore, she felt the presence of someone else in the room with her skin. Aunt Venus, is that you? The imposing figure of the guardian woman emerged from the shadows. Yes, my beauty. I'm back. Larry reluctantly took her eyes off the easel. How many times have I asked you not to sneak up from behind? You know how unpleasant it is to feel someone's breath on the back of your neck? The elderly woman stepped back a step. Oh, I'm not a stranger to you. I just didn't want to distract you from work. You're doing great. And where did such talent come from? The girl smiled. Don't you know that the gods distribute talents to people? Almost everyone gets an equal share, but not everyone knows about their gift. So, I was really lucky. Venus crossed herself and silently said a prayer. Only after this obligatory ritual did she turn to the artist. You must be very tired, right? Probably haven't eaten anything? Larry grabbed the brush again. I'm not hungry. The elderly woman exclaimed. What do you eat then? Holy air. Look at yourself. All dried up. Drop everything and go to the kitchen. I won't leave you alone until you eat. Larry smiled. Okay, Aunt Venus. I'll obey you and take the prescribed portion of food to support my mind and body. But first, you have to tell me how your trip went. Is he really my father? Venus said. I'll tell you everything in the kitchen. She decisively turned around and left the workshop. Larry set aside her brushes and immediately headed for the door. The girl limped slightly, but this flaw was noticeable only upon close observation. Larry was born with a congenital pathology, and it was thanks to Aunt Venus that this defect was almost completely eliminated. Nevertheless, the girl was still self-conscious about her imperfection and tried to appear in public as rarely as possible. She spent all her free time in a small workshop that her aunt allocated to her back in her school years. Larry was in the fifth grade when her talent fully manifested. She had started drawing even before she learned to walk, but even then, the lines and circles drawn on paper with a child's hand formed a harmonious whole. The caregivers at the kindergarten were amazed. Such a little girl, and she draws like a real artist. It was a pity that she was born with a pathology. The cause of Larry's chromatic condition was the different lengths of her limbs. To minimize the defect, Larry had to spend months undergoing traction therapy and walk with a metal construction on the shorter leg. Therefore, her only solace for many years remained drawing. In the fifth grade, the doctor allowed her to attend a regular school, but her classmates greeted the newcomer with disdain. They openly mocked the girl, calling her one-legged. Although Larry suffered greatly from the taunts of her peers, she never allowed herself to cry publicly. Only in Aunt Venus's cozy home did she feel protected. She confided all her troubles and grievances only to her guardian, who always comforted her. Don't break your heart, my girl. What matters is not what a person looks like on the outside. It's what's inside that counts. God didn't harm you, he endowed you with talent. Your drawings bring joy to people. You'll see, there will come a day when the whole world will be at your feet. 
Larry believed in this prediction. She dedicated all her free time to her favorite activity. The first solo exhibition of the young artist took place when she was in the seventh grade. Twenty of her brightest works, initiated by the school headmistress, were displayed in the lobby of an old cinema. By chance, a state newspaper correspondent attended the Vernissage. He was visiting relatives, and they dragged him to the event. The guy knew a thing or two about painting, and Larry's works immediately caught his attention. Of course, she's not a Manet, but she's a natural talent. I would love to meet the author of these undoubtedly talented works. In a small village that practically merged with the state center, everyone knew each other. Therefore, arranging a meeting between the journalist and the young artist was not difficult. However, Larry was embarrassed by the general attention, and she behaved like a frightened animal. For this reason, she had to answer the journalist's questions through Aunt Venus. Literally, the next day, a small article about Larry appeared in the state newspaper. The unexpected fame scared the girl, and she even skipped two days of school. Concerned about the absence of the student, the school headmistress visited their home. Larry, why are you skipping school? Have you become too proud? Aunt Venus had to defend her ward's honor. What are you talking about, Mrs. Lewis? Pride has nothing to do with it. The girl is afraid to show herself on the street. The school headmistress persuaded Larry not to do anything foolish. Talent is a very heavy burden. Once you let it slip away, it won't come back. So, my girl, be prepared for difficulties. Don't lose your most precious possession and you still need to go to school. The next day, Larry cautiously crossed the threshold of her familiar classroom. She was greeted with cheers. Larry, you're super. We're proud of you. Classmates even managed to prepare posters, and Christopher Brooks handed her a bouquet of flowers. In the evenings, he timidly asked for permission to walk her home. All week, Larry was in the spotlight. Therefore, when the passions subsided a bit, the girl breathed a sigh of relief. The minute of fame did not pass without a trace for Larry. Classmates started looking at her with respect, and she gained a real friend in the person of Christopher Brooks. But most importantly, no one called her one-legged anymore. Reaping the fruits of her ward's first success, Aunt Venus was also pleased. The pragmatic woman very much wanted to guide Larry's talent in the right direction. One evening, she declared. My girl. Now you can earn a living with your skill. By the way, one of my good acquaintances wants to make an unusual gift for her husband's anniversary. Maybe you can paint something beautiful? Larry couldn't refuse the woman who had replaced her mother. She worked on the order for three days, and the first client was delighted. This is incredible. I never thought our house looks so beautiful in a picture. Everything is here, the picket fence, the well, and you even drew the cat on the bench. Venus, thank you. The gift turned out excellent. Despite all the expressions of admiration addressed to Venus, Larry felt creative satisfaction. For her first work, she received a small fee, but the wise aunt assured her. A bad start is a start nonetheless. Later, we'll increase the price list. Larry wanted to object. Aunt Venus, it feels awkward taking money from your friends. The woman gave her a sidelong glance. It's even more awkward sleeping on the ceiling because the blanket falls off. Don't think about it, I won't take a cent. I'll save up for your education." The woman sat down and dreamily rolled her eyes. My girl, the day will come, and you'll enroll in the academy, where they teach art. You'll become famous worldwide. When your father learns about your successes, he'll be biting his elbows. This revelation made the girl wary because until then, Venus had always avoided talking about her parents. The girl leaned against her guardian's shoulder. Aunt, tell me, where is he? Why did he reject me? Is it because of my leg defect? Tears glistened in Larry's eyes, but once again, her guardian evaded a direct answer. God knows where he is. I didn't inquire about him, and your mother never told me anything. The elderly woman realized that in the outburst of joyful feelings, she had made an inexcusable mistake. Larry was a very sensitive girl. 
therefore, the truth about her parents could have a devastating impact on her. Years passed, and Larry no longer asked uncomfortable questions. Only once did she confess. Aunt Venus, even if he shows up. I won't talk to him. This statement caught the woman off guard. Sweetheart, who is he? Father. I'll never forgive him for abandoning me. Venus was ready to tell Larry the whole truth. A volcano was erupting in her soul, and an unpleasant voice in her head whispered. Tell her everything, don't carry a stone in your heart, it's a great sin. She was ready for confession, but her lips went numb as if paralyzed. Larry didn't notice that something was amiss with her aunt and spoke in a different tone. I don't want to talk about him anymore. I'd rather go to the workshop. However, as the proverb goes, the truth cannot be hidden for a long time. About a week ago, the same neighbor for whom Larry had painted a picture many years ago came to her. The woman lured the owner outside. Venus, we need to talk urgently. Venus stepped onto the porch and firmly closed the door behind her. Spill it, what do you have? The neighbor was a bit wary. I'm not sure. It might be false information. You know my future daughter-in-law works at the state hospital? Well, I know. What about it? The thing is, Barry Harris was admitted to them recently. Do you understand? Barry Harris, and the age matches, he's 46. In her nervousness, the woman's mouth dried up so much that her tongue stuck to her palate. With great difficulty, she uttered. Maybe it's just a coincidence? There are plenty of namesakes in the world. Venus, but the patronymic fits. This is definitely your husband's son. You should check it. If you want, I can ask my daughter-in-law to get information. Okay, I'm not against it. The next day, the neighbor came again. Impatience overwhelmed her, so she lost her vigilance. Venus, we couldn't find out anything specific because this Mr. Harris is practically considered dead. He has a pleasant wife and two children, already grown up. They don't leave the hospital, they're crying all the time. Venus yelled at her neighbor. Lower your voice, or Larry will hear you. Why are you so cautious about her? Yeah, well, nothing. She's very impressionable. Better tell me, what's wrong with this sick person? My daughter-in-law said his heart is failing. An urgent operation seems to be needed, but the relatives of this Mr. Harris apparently don't have money. My daughter-in-law overheard the daughter and the mother discussing where to borrow money. That's the story. Venus thanked her neighbor and opened the door, behind which Larry was anxiously waiting for her return. The girl immediately pounced on her guardian. Aunt Venus. I heard everything and understood that you were talking about my father. Is it true that he's dying? The elderly woman did not expect such a turn of events. Larry, I don't know. Most likely, it's a stranger who has encountered misfortune. The girl leaned against the door. But what if he's my father? Aunt Venus exclaimed. But you yourself said not long ago that you didn't want to see him. Now I want to see him. What if he dies, and I never meet him? I must go and find out everything today. Venus understood that her word no longer had power, and she had no right to deny Larry the desire to see her father. The only hope remained that there is a namesake in the hospital of the man who once abandoned the girl's mother. Larry called Christopher and asked him to take her to the city, but soon the girl returned and, answering the silent question of her aunt, said. This man is still in intensive care, and they don't let anyone in. But I managed to talk to our neighbor's daughter-in-law, and she confirmed that he is being prepared for surgery. She also said that he should be transferred from intensive care tomorrow. Venus asked. If you want, I'll go to the city tomorrow and find out everything. The girl happily said. Of course, I want. I'll ask Christopher. The aunt waved her hand. Don't drag the guy endlessly. He fulfills your every whim. I just can't understand when your incomprehensible friendship will turn into something normal? What do you mean? Larry. Don't pretend to be an angel. You're a grown woman. 
At your age, everyone already has a family and children. The girl's face instantly became impenetrable. Aunt Venus, let's not touch on this topic. Christopher treats me wonderfully. He's a great friend, but I have no right to deprive him of true happiness. Who needs a wife with such a defect? The aunt twirled her finger by her temple and said expressively. You're a fool, Larry, and you're not getting better. It's time to get rid of childish complexes. You're no worse than your peers. Everything is there for you, a pretty face, and a figure, and the fact that you limped on one leg, a smart person won't pay attention to that. Later that evening, Larry sneaked into her aunt's bedroom and whispered conspiratorially. Aunt Venus, I've come up with something. The elderly woman looked at her in bewilderment. What are you talking about? About the person who might turn out to be my father. Well, go on, what crazy idea has crossed your mind? The girl extended her palms forward, as if defending herself from an invisible enemy. Just don't interrupt me. Okay? Sure, go ahead. Don't beat around the bush. Aunt. I've decided to pay for the surgery. My money is just lying around and used anyway. Venus Makarova jumped off the bed. The shock was so strong that she couldn't utter a word. Only after a couple of minutes did the woman regain her composure. You're completely insane. Giving money for the salvation of a total stranger. But what if he's my father? I won't forgive myself if I don't help him. Venus, in silence, sank onto the bed. Larry remained silent for a while. Then, with determination as if the decision had already been made, she said. Even if he's not my father, I'll still be glad to save someone's life. The guardian tried timidly to object. Larry. What about the apartment? You wanted to move to the city. Never mind. I'm fine here with you. Venus spent the whole night with her eyes wide open, and in the morning, she took a bus to the hospital. She found the neighbor's future daughter-in-law and handed her an envelope with money. Gina, it's easier for you to handle all the paperwork on the spot. This is for Mr. Harris's surgery. The acquaintance initially tried to refuse the task. And Venus, but I. Gina, I've never asked you for anything. Do me this favor. After completing her mission, the elderly woman decided to visit the patient. The nurse initially hesitated to let her into the ward but eventually allowed her a brief visit. Venus recognized him immediately. Although she had only seen him in a photo that Cassandra always kept with her. The woman whispered quietly. It's him, without a doubt. He hasn't changed at all. Just his hair has thinned. She headed towards the exit, but at the door, she collided with a woman who, by the description, seemed to be his wife. So Venus hurriedly left the hospital. She saw the woman following her but didn't want to talk to her. Throughout the journey in Christopher's car, the thought that it was time to tell Larry everything didn't leave her. However, Aunt Venus was afraid that after this, the girl would refuse to communicate with her. Venus hastily set the table while simultaneously contemplating how to start the conversation with Larry. However, the girl beat her to it. She silently sneaked into the kitchen and loudly asked. Someone threatened to feed me until I lose my pulse. The elderly woman turned around, frightened. Larry. Is it okay, to joke like that? I might have a heart attack from fright. And how do you scare me? So, you decided to take revenge on your aunt? Well, thank you. Venus has lived to see the light of day. Here's your gratitude. Larry realized she had gone too far. She hugged her aunt. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. I thought we'd have a good laugh together. Tell me how your trip went. The aunt replied restrainedly. Fine. I handed the money to Gina. Asked her to take care of everything. So, I've done your task. The girl looked into the eyes of her benefactor. You didn't tell me the main thing. Did you see him? I did. It's your father. Unexpectedly, the elderly woman collapsed onto a chair, clasping her head with her hands. 
She cried loudly, making it difficult to understand what she was saying. I don't deserve forgiveness. It's all blind hatred. I wanted to avenge my ruined love. I thought revenge would bring me relief, but it only got worse. Larry became seriously concerned. Aunt, what's wrong with you? What revenge are you talking about? I'm done. I'll tell you everything. I can't carry this burden any longer. Take the letter in the book on the shelf, Quiet Ocean, is its name. Venus wiped away her tears, but a new bout of despair overcame her. She asked me to deliver this letter, and I hid it. I thought it would be better for everyone. No, I'm lying to you. I was afraid they'd take you away from me. After all, you, Larry, are the only thing I have. I live for you. The girl feverishly flipped through volume after volume of the legendary work. Finally, a yellowed envelope fell from the book. With trembling hands, she took out a notebook sheet and began reading the neatly written lines. Barry. I apologize for not responding to your letters. I thought it would be better for both of us. My Aunt Venus told me right away that I wasn't your equal. You're educated, and I only finished school. But still, I regret nothing because I loved you and still do. I'm writing to you so that you know you have a daughter. I didn't want to trouble you, and you wouldn't have known anything about us. But fate has decided, and I don't have much time left. You know I'm not accustomed to complaining, and I'll accept everything that fate has prepared for me. The only thing I ask of you is to take care of our girl." Larry didn't know how long she had sat there with that letter in her hands. Outside, dusk had already fallen, and the food prepared by her aunt remained untouched on the table. Venus sat on the same chair without moving. For a moment, Larry thought she wasn't breathing. The girl rushed to her aunt. Aunt Venus, don't be silent. You're scaring me. Why didn't you show me this letter earlier? Why didn't you tell me anything about my parents? I was afraid. I was very afraid that they would take you away from me. But revenge was the initial desire. But now there's no point in keeping silent. I'll tell you everything. Venus's childhood and youth passed in a small village not far from the state center. When the time came to choose a profession, she and her best friend Lisbeth went to college together. Both friends successfully passed their exams and were enrolled in educational institutions. Of course, besides their studies, the girls didn't deny themselves the pleasure of attending entertainment events. Every Saturday, they went dancing at the club. It was there that Venus met Barry Harris, who was studying at a construction college. Love ignited between the young couple instantly. Since both were already 18, they decided to solidify their relationship with marriage. When they happily arrived to submit their marriage registration application, the head clerk greeted them unfriendly. Oh my. You've barely dried the milk on your lips, and you're already in a hurry to get married. Do your parents even know? Such an address offended the groom, and he said to the official. What business is it of yours whether we informed our parents or not? We are adults. We have every right to enter into marriage by mutual consent. Isn't that right, Venus? Venus joyfully confirmed. Yes, you can't stop us. The clerk looked at them disdainfully. What kind of daycare is this? What am I supposed to do with you? Write your application. Maybe you'll change your minds in three months. Venus became bolder. No, ma'am. We won't change our minds because we love each other. They submitted their application and, feeling a sense of accomplishment, left the building. Austin lifted the girl in his arms, spinning with her. Venus. We did it. We are heroes. The girl also felt ecstatic and could already imagine herself in a wedding dress, but beyond the wedding, she didn't want to think in her imagination. Three months passed quickly. Of course, the parents of the newlyweds were shocked when they learned about the upcoming wedding. The bride and groom only informed them a week before the celebration. They were very afraid that their parents would cancel the wedding. But before the wedding fanfare could fade away, the newlywed husband received a draft notice from the military. The farewell was also noisy, and the young wife, as expected, 
promised to wait for her beloved from the army. She ran after the bus that carried the conscripts and shouted. Austin, write me letters. You can write every day, and I'll respond. The soldiers' letters did come regularly for the first few months, but then the thread was severed. Venus went to her husband's parents, trying to find out if anything unpleasant had happened to him, but there were no relatives at home. Venus desperately wanted to pour out her grief, and Lisbeth agreed to play the role of a soothing vest. The friend reassured her. Don't shed tears in vain. Everything will work out. You know how strict it is in the army. They have exercises and combat training all the time. Maybe they sent Austin on a special mission, like in the movies? Venus believed Lisbeth because it was more comforting that way. From her friend, she learned that her husband's parents had moved to the city. That's strange. Why didn't they tell me anything? After all, I'm not a stranger to them. But apparently, the Harris family had a different opinion on this matter. Venus eagerly awaited her husband's return from the army, but after his service, Austin did not return to the village. He wrote her a letter in which he requested a divorce. However, Venus didn't want to let go of the person she had planned to spend her entire life with. She rushed to search for him in the city, where, with great difficulty, she learned the new address of her husband's parents. Austin didn't even invite her into the apartment. He came out to the landing and said with feigned sadness. Venus. We made a big mistake. It's good that this ridiculous marriage didn't leave the consequence of children. She had never felt such shame before. Austin, when did you realize it was a mistake? Without hesitation, he replied. When I went to the army. You see, I felt nothing, no attachment. So that's why you stopped writing to me? Yes. I thought you would understand without explanations. With anger, she said. As you can see. I didn't understand because I'm stupid. She ran down the stairs, thinking that she wouldn't be able to live on. She already imagined everyone in the village laughing at her. Venus, as usual, decided to pour out her sorrow on the shoulder of her best friend. Lisbeth comforted her, patting her on the head, pleading. Venus, don't cry. He's not worthy of your tears. You will find a good guy and be happy with him. She wanted very much to believe her friend's words. And day after day, Venus poured out her soul to Lisbeth, but one day Lisbeth said. Venus. I'm leaving. The girl was stunned. Where to? You know, I'm so lucky. Good acquaintances found me a job in the city. They even found me an apartment. But what about me, Lisbeth? Her friend shrugged in amazement. Venus. You're already a grown-up girl, you'll manage on your own. I can't wipe away all your tears in life. This statement deeply offended Venus, and she didn't even go to see her friend off at the train station. Time passed, and one day news came from the city that Austin Harris had married Lisbeth. Venus's mother couldn't calm down for a long time. That's the friend you have. Lisbeth cleverly led you astray. She comforted you, comforted you, and took away your husband. On that day, Venus decided to take revenge on her tormentors, but she didn't yet know how to do it in a way that would hurt Lisbeth and Austin. This plan turned into a fixed idea. The unsuccessful marriage negatively affected the young woman's life, and she tried twice more to start a family, but it never worked out. Therefore, she devoted all her unspent love to her niece Cassandra, the daughter of her brother, who was serving a long sentence in a maximum security prison. Cassandra's mother led a dissolute lifestyle, for which she was deprived of parental rights. Apparently, bad genetics affected the girl's health. Cassandra was constantly ill and often stayed in the hospital. Venus worried a lot about her niece when she went to the city for further studies after finishing school. But contrary to her worst expectations, the girl changed for the better. After college, she got a job in that same village, but Venus decided not to interfere with Cassandra's life. She believed it would be better that way. The niece often called her and visited on weekends. One day, Venus noticed that Cassandra's waist had noticeably rounded. She jokingly said to her. 
Why, is your stomach expanding? Probably eating too much flour? Cassandra blushed quickly. No, auntie, it's something else. I'll have a little one soon. Are you getting married? Not yet, but don't think anything bad. We were dating only a little, and everything happened by accident. First time I've heard that children happen accidentally. Does he know? No, auntie. I haven't told him anything yet. I mean, I wanted to tell him, but I found out that Barry is marrying the girl he dated before me. I thought it wouldn't be right to ruin someone else's happiness. And what about yourself? Did you think about the child who will grow up without a father? Venus was furious. She wanted to tell her niece that she was following in her parents' footsteps, but she held back. Cassandra struggled with pregnancy, and Venus had to move in with her. Larry was born a month and a half prematurely. The girl was very weak and gained weight slowly. When she was three months old, doctors discovered a defect in her. At that time, Venus was still working but had to quit to be able to help her niece. Cassandra was very grateful, and one day she told Venus about her failed love. As soon as Venus heard the familiar last name, anger overwhelmed her. Again, the Harris family. Are we destined to endure mockery forever from this family? But the woman didn't continue this thought. Thinking that there were many namesakes in the world, she restrained herself. The niece showed her a photo where she stood with this guy near the fountain. Venus immediately shuddered, barely holding back from shouting. It's him. He looks exactly like Austin, and he's just as despicable as his father. No matter how much Cassandra reassured her aunt that Barry knew nothing about the child, Venus stigmatized his name with shame. Sooner or later, all this will come back to him like a boomerang. Daddy left for the other world earlier than expected, and he will repeat his path. Aunt, is it right to say such things? I tell you Barry is not at fault at all, and I don't regret having a daughter from someone I love. But such a state of affairs did not satisfy Venus. The thirst for revenge consumed her soul. Several times, she tried to find Barry's address, but then she gave up this dubious endeavor because Cassandra fell seriously ill. She spent almost all her time in the hospital on drips, and doctors warned. Prepare for the worst because one day her kidneys will fail completely. Your niece shouldn't have given birth, and doctors told her that, but she acted in her own way. Larry was not yet five years old when she lost her mother. Venus Makarovna immediately took custody, deciding to dedicate the rest of her life to raising the girl. Anna felt like her heart was about to jump out of her chest. She could barely stand on her feet from the bad premonitions. Darby hadn't called. That meant she hadn't managed to get money from Larry's unknown father. Anna climbed to the third floor in the hospital, already imagining what the doctor would tell her about her husband. But she didn't make it to the attending physician's office because she met Mr. Adams near the elevator. The doctor greeted her warmly. Ah, Mrs. Anna Harris. As they say, the ice is broken. Tomorrow we will operate on your husband, and today, after lunch, we'll transfer him to the cardiology center. The woman froze in amazement, but the doctor considered her confusion excitement for a loved one. He patted her shoulder in a friendly manner. Don't worry so much. Everything will be fine. I'm just sure of it. Citing his incredible workload, the doctor bid farewell to the woman, and she stood in the corridor for a long time trying to understand what had happened. Finally, it dawned on her. Oh my god. Why am I racking my brain? Darby probably arranged everything, but she didn't inform me. In complete confidence in the correctness of her guess, the woman hurried to her husband's ward, but there was already another person lying there. The nurse walked past her with a tray covered with a napkin and said displeasedly. Woman, you're getting in the way of work. Anna followed the girl. Tell me, where is my husband? He was in this ward yesterday. The girl said on the go. When will all this end? Woman, we don't give out information about patients. All the information is in the registry. Go there and find out about your husband. Anna felt like crying, and at that moment, a female sanitary worker, who was cleaning the floor in the corridor, said. 
they transferred your husband to cardiology. Half an hour ago, I personally took him on a gurney to the first floor, and the guys from the center took him further. Look for him there. The unfamiliar word unpleasantly jolted her hearing, but the woman merely frowned. She thanked the sanitation worker and headed back to the elevator, but the employee decided to provide additional information. You'd better walk. We have a covered walkway in the hospital. Once you go down to the second floor, walk a bit through the corridor, and you'll see a sign. Thank you very much. Following the sanitation worker's advice, Anna Harris walked along the specified route, pondering the diversity of people. Despite having the same job, the nurse seemed on edge and unable to express herself normally. Anna mentally thanked the sanitation worker again, but disappointment awaited her in the cardiology department. A similarly young nurse informed her. Mr. Harris is already being prepared for surgery. So, you won't be able to see him today. Then I'll wait here. Is it okay? The girl smiled. Actually, we get scolded if relatives linger here for too long. Yes, I know waiting outside the operating room is the worst. You'll just get more anxious. You better go home and call after lunch. Will the surgery really take that long? Sometimes our surgeons stay at the operating table for 10 hours or more. That's their job. The girl sighed expressively and smiled again, a smile full of warmth and kindness that slightly eased Anna Harris's heart. She walked slowly along the familiar route to the hospital exit, but her daughter's shout stopped her. Mom, wait. Darby ran down the corridor, and from her flushed face, it was evident she had already completed a marathon through the floors. She approached her mother and, still catching her breath, began reporting. Mom, you can't even imagine what I had to endure today. I ran to Larry in the morning. He had already talked to Dad yesterday. By the way, not all rich guys are stingy. Dad immediately gave as much money as we needed. So, I took the money and ran to the hospital again to pay for the surgery. And they tell me it's already paid. I'm standing there like a fool and don't understand. Mom, was it really that hard to call me and say that you've sorted everything out? Anna Harris was at a loss for words due to confusion. Darby had to make an extra effort to restore her mother's ability to speak. Darby, I thought you beat me to it. So, you didn't pay anything? No. I called everyone on that list, but the result was zero. Although Nick Butler contacted me in the evening and said that the college staff decided to chip in, but gathering the necessary amount would be difficult. That's interesting then. And who is the secret benefactor who decided to help us? Anna Harris shrugged. I have no idea, but it doesn't matter now. The main thing is that your father will live if the operation goes well. Darby remarked with a touch of sarcasm. Mom, let's skip the ifs. I don't like uncertainty in any form, and I will find out who this wizard in the blue helicopter is. Why in blue? That's how it's sung in the song. A wizard in a blue helicopter will come to us and give money for free. Anna Harris frowned. Darby. Can't you do without your slang? I can, but then I'll look like an alien, and no one will understand me. In short, Mom, you go home, and I'll stick around a bit more to gather information. Darby's reconnaissance operation didn't last long. She burst into the apartment and, still in her outdoor shoes, walked into the living room where her mother sat in front of the TV, trying to distract herself from gloomy thoughts. Anna Harris only managed to exclaim. Darby. You're not at the train station. But her daughter didn't let her say more. Mom, save your moralizing for later. I've got such information that you'll faint. I don't need to end up in the hospital too. You and Mark will be in trouble then. Darby took off her boots and sat on the couch next to her mother. Of course, Mark and I will be in trouble without you, but you're distracting me from the main topic. The girl dramatically rolled her eyes and took a deep breath. Continuing the story of my adventures. So, I went to the accounting office to find out what's what. And there, a lady in glasses looks at me as if I fell from the moon and says to me, we are not allowed to disclose confidential information. And I tell her, I have every right to know who paid for my father's surgery. 
Picture this, mom. The lady's glasses even fogged up from mental effort. Darby clearly enjoyed her little triumph, and Anna Harris had to calm her daughter a bit. How long will you torture me? Let's get to the point. Who is this mysterious sponsor? Darby pouted. Mom, it's not even interesting for you. You always disappoint me, but since you can't wait, listen. All the documents were processed by a certain Gina Gray. I got a lead and found this woman. She works in neurology and is the daughter-in-law of our neighbor. Now, mom, brace yourself, and I almost fainted when I heard the surname, Harris. So, do we have relatives we know nothing about? Quite an interesting story, isn't it? Anna Harris waved her hand, as if invisible flies were buzzing around her. Darby, you said so much that I didn't understand anything. Some neighbors, unknown relatives. Well, there are plenty of people with the same personal data in the world, right? As far as I know, your dad has no aunts or uncles. He was the only child in the family. Darby didn't give up. Mom, in life, there are also second and third cousins. Darby, stop it. My head is already splitting without your help. Do you really want to go searching for this mysterious woman who casually brought almost two million in an envelope? Do I look like an idiot? We need to wait for the surgery results first, and then we can go on a thank you mission to that neighbor. Without getting up from the couch, Darby put on her boots. Her mother asked with concern. Where are you running off to again? I need to return the money. Yes, and be sure to thank Larry's dad. I know, without your hints. By the way, Larry has cool parents. They're both historians. They used to go on excavations in their youth, and now they write scientific articles. His father tells such stories that are breathtaking. I should have enrolled in the history department back in my time. Darby. It's time for you to decide at your age. You're behaving like a teenager. Nothing. I'll get married, and I'll straighten up right away. When Darby went about her business, Anna Harris wanted to call the hospital to inquire about the surgery. But before she could reach the phone, which had long been neglected on the table in the hallway, it rang. The ring was so loud that the woman startled. She picked up the receiver and immediately heard a lively female voice. Anna Harris? Yes, it's me. This is the hospital calling. You came today, and we talked a bit. The surgery is already done, and everything went well. The woman understood that the nurse with the warm smile was the one who wanted to share good news. She asked. Can I visit my husband today? No, it's better to come tomorrow closer to noon. He'll still be sleeping for a long time after anesthesia, and it's better not to disturb him now. A wave of calmness spread through her body. Anna Harris took the remote and randomly pressed one of the buttons. Instantly, funny characters from a popular children's cartoon appeared on the screen, and a familiar childhood song played. She leaned back on the couch and closed her eyes. She thought. How good it is that there are still wizards in the world. The bouquet of scent seeped through the narrow gap in the poorly closed kitchen door. These incomparable smells evoked pleasant memories, and Barry Harris loudly asked, so his wife could hear. Anna, do you remember the picnic we had at the old dacha on our 10th wedding anniversary? The answer came immediately. How can I forget? You and Nick Butler organized such a masquerade that the whole village was scared. Dressing up in fur coats and leather jackets in the summer and walking around the village like that? Anna Harris sat down on the couch next to her husband, and Barry Harris smiled at her. Yes, we had a bit too much to drink with Nick, but the local guys understood us. I'm talking about the group that ran out of the bathhouse. Well, yes. They took you for their own because they had also had a bit too much to drink. Yes, one even grabbed a stick and shouted, Brothers. Vikings have come for us. Then the wives showed them both Vikings and 300 Spartans. Why did you suddenly remember that picnic? The smells from the kitchen awakened memories. So, you're hungry? That's a good sign. Wait a bit. Soon everything will be ready. I'll fatten you up, 
you've become too skinny. The woman went to the kitchen but returned to the room. Barry, I want to ask you. Do you have relatives living nearby? I mean relatives of your father or mother. The man answered immediately. No. All the relatives scattered across the country. Parents used to correspond with them, but then mobile phones appeared, and, strangely enough, the connection was lost. The woman said quietly. So, a namesake. Anna. You're speaking in riddles. Obviously, I missed something important while lying in the hospital. Please, open all the secrets for me. Anna Harris was about to tell her husband about the strange story with the money for his surgery, but at that moment, the apartment door opened with a bang, and, entering the hallway, Darby announced. Looks like I'm just in time. It smells so delicious. The mother warned her daughter. You know that dad shouldn't be upset. Could have informed about your arrival more quietly. Darby made a guilty expression. Mom, I'll definitely make up for it. The girl approached the couch and kissed her father. Hi, Daddy. How are you? Fine. Just waiting for an invitation to the table. Mom decided to torture me. Cooking something delicious and not inviting to the table. And we'll hurry up, we'll go to the kitchen now. The girl helped her father get up from the couch. Daddy, lean on me. But the man pushed her hand away. No. I can manage on my own. We need to start getting used gradually. Don't rush too much. It's only two days after discharge. Mr. Adams said that we need to gradually return to our usual life. Anna Harris looked at her loved ones with love. It's a shame that Mark isn't here. Barry Harris asked. When will he come? Promised by the weekend. Darby, forgetting about her mother's warning, shouted. Super. Larry and I planned a very important event for this weekend. Of course, I'm not sure if Dad should attend. Barry Harris interrupted his daughter. Today is only Monday. I'll get used to it by Saturday, and I'll be running around. Tell us, daughter, what kind of event requires our presence? Darby blushed. Can't you guess yourself? The man exclaimed. Could it be an engagement? Well, something like that. Larry and I are against unnecessary fuss, but his parents are stubborn. They said it's a tradition, and we should follow it. You'll have to endure it with Larry. Yeah, no big deal. We've endured worse. By the way, you'll have to endure a bit too because Larry's dad can't live without creativity. He came up with a unique format. First, a thematic exhibition, but that will pass quickly, and then dinner at a restaurant, but everything will be family style. So, there will be a chance to relax. Anna Harris happily said. It will also be an opportunity to thank Larry's dad. Barry Harris was surprised. Again, did I miss something? What are you thanking him for? Mother and daughter, interrupting each other, started telling how they searched for money for the surgery. They told about the unknown benefactor. Barry Harris pondered for a moment, then quietly said. So, I owe my life to an unknown woman? And here I thought it was Nick who helped. He visited me in the hospital after the surgery. Sang praises in his honor. Anna Harris sadly said. Nick Butler practically refused me right away, just like my best friend. So, you should think about it. Can such a partner be trusted? Darby decided to contribute to the discussion of this important topic. Yes. That's why they say true friends reveal themselves in trouble. I'm glad my Larry is not like that. So, I can confidently marry him. Barry Harris smirked. Each of us has drawn their own conclusions. But I think Darby wins the most. She has seen the high moral qualities of her fiancé. Anna Harris was the most nervous on Saturday. She tried to calm the trembling in her body with the method recommended by her daughter, but it only helped temporarily. In anxiety, the woman moved from the wardrobe to the large mirror, asking her daughter. Darby, do you think this dress is suitable for a social event? 
Maybe it's better to wear an evening dress with sequins? The role of a consultant didn't suit the girl, and she replied with undisguised irritation. Mom, sequins in broad daylight? You'll look like a Christmas tree. Don't torture yourself in vain. You look very impressive in a cream-colored suit. But it's too formal. Remember. Classic is appropriate everywhere. The woman began to try on the suit, expressing her surprise. Where did you get such knowledge of fashion? Mom, from the university. We studied the history of women's and men's costumes. Don't think your daughter is a complete failure. And I don't think so. You are the best children in the world. The first time in my 22 years that I hear a compliment about myself. Darby helped her mother style her hair beautifully and assessed her appearance with satisfaction. Perfect. You need to go out more often, otherwise, you'll disappear completely in your apartment. The exhibition of paintings by local artists took place at the recently opened History Museum Gallery. Although there were few visitors, there was a sense of liveliness. Darby disappeared somewhere right after the modest opening ceremony, leaving her parents to enjoy the world of art. Barry Harris, still very weak, and Anna Harris constantly asked him about his well-being. Barry, how are you? Is your head spinning? For a while, the man patiently answered that he felt okay, but then he whispered to his wife's ear. Anna. We're at an exhibition, not in the clinic. Okay. I won't do it anymore. The woman also whispered in response. There were not so many works in the hall, so acquainting themselves with them took little time. The Harris spouses strolled leisurely through the hall. Suddenly, Anna Harris squeezed her husband's hand painfully. Barry Harris asked anxiously. Anna, what's wrong with you? Barry, that woman is here. Remember? I told you about her. The stranger in black? Yes, yes, the one who came into your ward. Only today she's quite decently dressed. I understand that she's my benefactor? I should go and thank her. If it weren't for her, I probably wouldn't be admiring these masterpieces now. Anna held on to her husband's arm tighter, and they walked together to the opposite end of the hall, where a crowd of expressionism enthusiasts had gathered. Inadvertently, Anna listened to the voices and realized that connoisseurs were discussing paintings by a young artist named Larry. She even thought, what a rare and beautiful name. While the wife mentally admired the name of the unknown artist, Barry Harris couldn't take his eyes off one of the canvases. The work was titled, Girl on a Swing, and stood out with the airiness of colors. The painting depicted the fragile figure of a girl in a white polka dot dress. The artist captured the moment when her heroine soared on a swing towards the clouds. A mysterious smile froze on Barry Harris's face. He whispered. How much this nymph resembles the girl I dated in my youth. Jealousy awakened in the woman's heart. You never told me anything about this before. And where is your nymph now? I don't know. Well, we never had anything serious. True, I tried to find her. Even wrote her letters, but Cassandra's relative, that was the girl's name, wrote to me, asking me to leave her alone because she got married. Well, I didn't want to bother her. Anna Harris didn't let her husband finish. Barry, you can tell me about your love later. Let's go. See that woman standing on the side? Do you see her? I see. I think now is the most convenient time to approach her. Venus immediately noticed the Harris family in the hall, but she didn't want to rush events. And it couldn't change anything now. After the conversation with Larry, she decided to fully submit to fate. She said to herself, let it be as it should. If I deserve punishment, let the Lord punish me. And today she didn't want to go to the exhibition, but Larry insisted. Auntie, stop sitting at home. You're not a prisoner, you're a modern woman, and besides, I want you to be there. After all, my success is the result of your hard work. Larry picked out an outfit for her aunt and tidied up her hair. At the last moment, Christopher Brooks offered to accompany the women. The young man hinted that after the exhibition, a pleasant surprise awaited them. Venus confidently said. 
No, how does Christopher plan to propose to you? It's long overdue, and everything keeps going around in circles and can't decide. Larry blushed with embarrassment but didn't say anything. Like all girls her age, she wanted to be happy. She felt that Christopher, who had been courting her for over ten years, still harbored a fear that her chosen one would suffer from ridicule for marrying a girl with a flaw. Today, his determined attitude surprised her. Larry thought. Maybe my aunt is right, and I have a chance to be happy. Perhaps the happiness of being loved is given to me for not sparing money to save a person. I wonder if he knows who helped him. When the Harris family approached Venus, she immediately said. I knew you would find me. But your recovery is not my merit. Barry Harris felt uncomfortable under the piercing gaze of this woman, but he didn't look away and asked firmly. Who's then? I want to thank everyone who participated in my rescue. At that moment, Larry joined them. She smiled, and this smile was the answer to all questions. Barry Harris felt a slight tremor, and the young artist said in a soothing voice. I know I look a lot like mom, and you haven't changed at all. Anna Harris didn't understand what was happening. She shifted her gaze from one participant in this scene to another. Can someone explain to me? Venus dryly said. Yes, it's time to put everything in its place. So, you finally found your father, or vice versa, he found her. Lived nearby for almost a quarter of a century, and met for the first time in life. Yes, everything happens in this life. So, there's nothing to be surprised about. Two years passed. The Harris family decided to celebrate the revival of the Dacha estate in style. Barry Harris warned his wife in advance that he wanted to spend time strictly within the family circle. Don't you dare invite your Bessie. After everything that happened, I don't want to see her. Anna Harris reassured her husband. Don't consider me more foolish than yourself. There will only be our children, in-laws, and, of course, Venus. That's right. Without her, we won't make it. The woman looked sternly at her husband. Don't try to sweet-talk me. Are you trying to hide your failure? Why have you never told Larry about her mom? Barry Harris waved his hands in despair. Anna, I beg you, don't start again. This was all before I met you. Every man has chance encounters. Do I really have to talk about all this? It won't make you feel any better. Quite the opposite. So, it turns out you spared my self-esteem? What nobility? Anna, calm down. What was, is already in the past, and there's no need to talk about it now, when our grandchildren are about to arrive. Please don't stir up trouble. Be kinder to Larry. Show some mercy. The girl has suffered enough in her life. She's not the only one. I also had to taste the bitter water. Anna. Are you jealous of me with your daughter? Anna Harris put aside the knife with which she was cutting onions and burst into tears. Barry, I don't recognize myself. Yes. After you were born again the second time. I envy you to everyone and I don't know how to get rid of this jealousy. The man hugged his wife to his chest and tried to comfort her. Don't get rid of it. Jealousy in moderation is like pepper in a spicy dish. It only adds spice. But now I'll know that after so many years of marriage, you still love me. There was a noise from behind, and the spouses simultaneously said. The kids have arrived. Darby led the procession, and behind her walked Larry, carrying a portable cradle. Slightly behind, Larry and Christopher walked arm in arm, and at the very end of the guest chain was Venus. Darby quickly kissed her parents. Mom, Dad. Mark will arrive later, and Larry's parents promise to visit your dacha next time. Although, in essence, there's nothing to show here, the barn stands as it stood. Barry Harris objected. If there's a will, there's a way. I was thinking, in my spare time, what if we all together start a grand construction project? What do you young folks think about that? Darby answered for everyone. Generally positive. Dad, your idea isn't bad. 
There's a grain of rationality in it. Right, Larry? Larry instantly responded to her wife's voice, but Darby laughed. Dear. In this company, you're not the only Larry. You now have a person with the same name. Darby surveyed the clearing near the house, where parents conjured together over the barbecue. Then she looked at those who had come for the picnic. Guys. Only now I realize how great it is to have a big family. No, really. It feels like you're in armor. Larry embraced her stepsister. I always dreamed of having a big, close-knit family too. Darby patted her on the shoulder. Don't worry. You still have everything ahead of you. You and Christopher will have a bunch of boys or girls, and then you'll teach them all to draw. Larry said. Oh, Darby, I almost forgot. I have a serious matter with you. You understand legal matters, right? No, it's my Larry who is well prepared in legislative matters. What's your problem? Well, nothing supernatural. I just want to open something like my school or an art class. I have the money for it, but I need a competent lawyer to avoid trouble. Barry Harris interrupted his barbecue preparation. You won't get into trouble, Larry. Your proposal is just in time. After all, Darby and I have long been contemplating a family business, but either the timing wasn't right or opinions didn't align, and now we have full agreement on all issues. Your idea fits perfectly into the concept of our educational center. Venus sat on the sidelines and thought. Everyone forgot about me. I'm not needed by anyone at this celebration. But she didn't have time to fully complete this bitter thought when Anna's voice rang out. Aunt Venus, why are you sitting there alone? Come here. Help me a bit. I'm coming, Anna. The elderly woman hurried to the call, whispering to herself. No. There is some use from me after all. So, I am still needed. 